As I said last week, we're going to be looking at some principles in the Bible concerning addiction. For today, I'll use the addiction of pornography as the catalyst for this message, though eventually we'll apply much of what we talk about to many types of addiction. And I have to say, this is truly one of the most difficult messages I've tried to put together as of late. Um, There's so many thoughts that have raced through my mind as I'm trying to put this together. I'm thinking, should I include this? Should I include that? Do I go here? Do I go there? And just about the time I come up with an outline, it's like, oh, wait a minute, I forgot to add this. And let me just say, you cannot cover overcoming addiction in one message. But I do believe that God's Word gives us a great foundation and gives us the only foundation by which we can overcome addiction. And I have to believe that there is power in the Word of God to help us overcome and, as we sang about, break every chain. Amen? If we don't have God's power in the Word of God, what do we have? Willpower? (laughs) We've talked about that before, and we'll talk about that again. And many of us make New Year's resolutions and, and... as we would call, very difficult decisions, only to find out that, man, we fail. We're not strong enough. We're not as powerful as we think we are to overcome the struggles of our life. And so, this morning we're going to look at some basic bedrock principles in God's Word that will help us if we apply the principles biblically and consistently, will help us overcome various types of addiction. But I want to concentrate just for a few moments this morning on the addiction of pornography because it's an epidemic that is not excluded from the church. Uh, Early in my ministry, I would hear statistics regarding pornography and would quickly conclude, well, thank God that's not my church. Man, was I wrong. When I was a youth pastor, I'd hear stories about how pornography would lead to uh, child molestation and other heinous crimes, and I would think, well, praise God, that's not in my youth group, only to find out that it was. I remember thinking, hearing the statistics that three out of every five men in the church are involved with pornography, and I remember thinking to myself, no, thank God, not in my church, I know my guys. And then God would miraculously bring us a special speaker on one particular Sunday or another, and he would address the issue, and all of a sudden the men would come forward. It's absolutely been the case in every church I've been a part of, including this one. And before some of you women think to yourselves, that's absolutely disgusting that a man would look at a naked woman and want to look at that. Before you think that's absolutely disgusting, let me just remind you that pornography is not just a man's sin. Statistically, and these are taken from the government, and these are taken from the... Uh, many various polls, but statistically, there are almost as many women with addictions to pornography as men. And that has been the case in the churches I've pastored as well. So it's not just a man's sin any longer. In the last five to seven years, the sales of pornography to women have been almost as high as men. It's a difficult thing to talk about. But it's a reality in the world that we live in. And folks, we have to do something about it. It is destroying families. It's destroying... I can stand up here this morning and tell you I know pastors who've had to resign from their churches because they've been caught being involved with pornography. I know men who were, from everyone's viewpoint, looking at them, man, they're great men, godly men, faithful men, who've been lost, who have lost their jobs and been fired from their jobs for viewing pornography on the work site. It's an epidemic that needs to be addressed. According to George Barna's research, nearly 40% of evangelical Christian men admit openly to viewing pornography online. And they think it's okay. Nearly 40% of those who profess to know Jesus as men think it's okay. It is estimated that nearly 60 to 70 percent of men view pornography somewhat regularly. In fact, several years ago, Focus on the Family did a research, some research, 
And they asked the question to pastors, nearly 3,000 pastors, mostly in the evangelical circles, and they said, how many of you would admit to viewing pornography? 30% of pastors admit to looking at pornography regularly. And the old saying goes, if the pastor is doing it, think what the people are doing. It is ranked somewhere between the fifth and seventh largest industry in America. And it's moving towards the top very quickly. It brings in an estimated 13 to 14 and a half billion dollars a year, the sale of pornography. Why would anybody want it to stop? And let me just say this. Some of the things that he mentioned in the video that these three men mentioned, but there's a key phrase that was said by two of the guys. Sin thrives in secrecy. Sin thrives in secrecy. And it doesn't matter whether it's pornography or any other addiction under the sun. Where do most people want to submit to their addiction? In privacy, in secrecy, so that nobody will see me. Ask a parent who's got an addiction to alcohol. Do they want their kids to see them just, you know, drunk out of their gourd? No, they don't want the ones their children to see it. As somebody who's high on drugs, they don't want their kids to see them that way. They want to do it in secret where nobody knows. Where do men, where do women indulge in fantasy, in secrecy, when they think they're alone and when nobody's watching? Sin thrives in secrecy. That's why sin must be exposed. And the then gentleman was right. The church doesn't talk about it very often. This was one of the things that the hotbed topics that as I put it out there several months ago, this was one of the things that they asked me to preach on. Because nobody's addressing it. And it's an epidemic that is killing our churches, guys. You have to understand this. That if we don't get a grasp on this, our churches are going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. Because you cannot indulge in sin and expect God's blessing at the same time. So it must be dealt with. So this morning I want to give you six things that you can do to help overcome addictions. Six things that I do believe that, no, it's not a pill, it's not a medication, it's not a, if you do this, boom, overnight, your, your addiction is gone. If you will do these six things... And there may be other things that we could add to it. Because I said you can't cover an entire, in one message, an entire topic of addiction like that. But if you will do these six things, you'll have a good start on, and be on your way to overcoming whatever addiction you may have. And you may not like how I say a couple of these things, but there's truth in the principle found in God's Word. And let me just say this before we get into these six principles. Sin is sin. So whether you think that pornography is worse than your overeating, really? Check that one before God. See if that's really true. And whether you think that your addiction of taking pills and too many pain meds is better than, you know, smoking heroin or, or shooting heroin and smoking meth or whatever, you think that's better? Check it before God. Which one's better? I think you'd have to come to the conclusion that they're all pretty well disgusting in His sight. And let me just say, it doesn't have to be something as harmful as drugs, alcohol, or sex for it to be an improper or an imbalanced or a bad addiction. It can be a hobby. It can be a work situation. So let me just give you these six things. Number one, you must learn to love God more than you love that sin. Pretty simple, isn't it? Learn to love God more than you love that sin. In fact, in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 9, it says, No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do this immense evil and how could I sin against God? I mean, think about it just for a moment. Joseph is in the house and he's given everything at his control. Everything that he has a possibility of wanting or, or managing is underneath his control. And after all, if, you know, if the king's wife wants to have him, who would know about it, right? Once again, there's that secrecy that's tempted there in that moment. 
And he says, well, how can I have do this immense evil, number one? We have to view it as God views it. And I have to learn to love God more than I love that sin. Because as long as I love the sin more, God's control in my life will be very weak. And then he says, how can I do this immense evil and how can I sin against God? He had a viewpoint that, hey, I want to love God more than I love this. Even though no one else might know about it. Proverbs chapter 23. Verses 26 through 28 says, My son, give me your heart, and let your eyes observe my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit, and a wayward woman is a narrow well. Indeed, she sets an ambush like a robber, and increases the number of unfaithful people. Here's the idea. Three things here. And you've heard it said before, it's not original with me. So sin will take you farther than you ever meant to go. Sin will keep you longer than you meant to stay. And sin will cost you far more than you meant to pay. The bottom line is the grass is not greener on the other side. And I've heard excuses even in the last couple of months where someone who was caught involved in, in situations that were less than godly, less than biblical, and they basically said this comment, well, if my wife would give me what I wanted, I wouldn't have to look elsewhere. That is hogwash. The bottom line is, it's not up to your wife to satisfy your every control, men. It's up to you to be satisfied by God first and primarily before anything else. Is our satisfaction found in God or is it found in what someone else can do for me? And I'm telling you what, I don't care whether it's sex, whether it's pornography, whether it's pills, whether it's smoking, it doesn't matter whether it's alcohol, whatever it is. I need to find more satisfaction in the things of God than I find in those things bringing me temporary satisfaction. Sometimes we have this idea that the grass is greener on the other side. No, it's not. It's not. So the question we have to ask ourselves do I have the same view of sin that God has of sin? Joseph said, how can I do this immense evil and how can I sin against my God, my Master? So number one, you must learn to love God more than you love that sin. And let me just say this, when we're involved in the throes of sin, and oftentimes I ask this question along with it. How's your devotional life? How's your prayer life? How's reading the Bible coming along as you're involved in that sin that's overcoming you? Because oftentimes those are the things that dissipate in our lives when the other things that are not right, are not proper, begin to escalate. You will rarely find that someone is walking in fellowship with God, having a vibrant prayer life and a vibrant time in the Word of God, and at the same time indulging in the sinfulness that they know is wrong. One begins to take control. And unless you are filled with the Spirit, the flesh will prevail. Romans 8 reminds us of that. It says, He that minds the things of the flesh sets his mind on the things of the flesh. In other words, it didn't just happen. I chose to do it. Number two, you need to admit your sin, admit the addiction, admit the struggle. You know, sometimes we have this idea that if I just kind of sweep it under the carpet and pretend it's not there and kind of just make it a minimal thing in my life that it's really not that big a deal, keep telling myself it'll kind of go away. It doesn't go away. Ask somebody who's an alcoholic if it just goes away. Ask somebody who's been involved in drugs if it just goes away and their urge never comes back again, ever. It doesn't just go away. You need to admit it so that you can deal with it. Why? Because sin thrives in secrecy. You need to come out with it. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13 says this. The one who conceals his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them will find what? Mercy. You want the ability to overcome? You need to deal with it. You need to confess it. There's no justifying it. There's no rationalizing it. There's no excusing it away. And let me just say, we do this more than we think. We're pretty good at blame shifting. We're pretty good at shifting the responsibility of whatever it is that we're involved with and kind of giving the justification for it. 
Well, you know, I was abused as a child. Am I saying that's no big deal? Absolutely not. Those, those things are traumatic. But 40 years later, I can't pin my excuses on it because I have responsibility for my own actions. We have to take responsibility for the things that we choose to do. You say, well, my parents didn't treat me very good. Okay, but you know better because you have God's Word to guide you. And you can't pin it on what happened 40 years ago. Several years ago, I had someone in my office who blew up in a temper tantrum. And the gentleman who was sitting beside her says, well, you have to excuse her. Her father yelled at her when she was a child. And I'm thinking, she's 67 years old. What happened when she was eight is now far past relevant. Quit blaming what we do on the, on the circumstances of the past. There has to come a point where we admit what we're doing and realize that it is sinful before a holy and righteous God. And I can't justify it no matter how much I try. I can't excuse it no matter how hard I try. I can't rationalize it because I'm responsible for the things that I do. And God's Word is clear. He who conceals it or hides it cannot overcome it. You will not have God's blessing. And here's what I say in my own struggle. I say, well, do I have addictions? Oh, yeah, I probably have some struggles that aren't great. I'm not a toothpick, if you haven't noticed. I like food. But, you know, I've never had someone put a gun to my head and say, hey, you better eat another Whopper. I mean, trust me, I like Whoppers. With cheese, extra mayo, ketchup oozing out. I mean, I have a, th I have a philosophy with burgers. The messier they are, the better they taste. I mean, the more gook that flies out the side, the better they are, right? Can I get an amen? I've never had someone put a gun to my head and say, Pastor Ken, you got to eat another one. Man, I willfully did it. I chose to do it. And there's been times in my life where I said, God is like, man, help me not to have these desires. I, I, I shouldn't want this much. Nobody ever put a gun to anyone's head and said, you need to drink a little more alcohol. I mean, that liquor is going to help you feel just a little bit better. Nobody ever put anyone, a gun to anyone's head and said, hey, you need to take another handful of pills. It's a struggle, and the struggle is real. But we have to admit, it, when it's a struggle, it's a struggle. We have to admit it and deal with it. Because it doesn't go away by itself. Number three. You need to submit yourself to God and His Word. And can I just say this, in submitting ourselves to God and His Word, number three, we need to remove any and all obstacles that could hinder victory. Let me give you several verses here. Psalm 119.11 says, I have treasured your Word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. God, in His Word, very clearly says what? If you will submit yourself to my Word... Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not, what? Sin. If sin is overcoming me, there's probably a good chance that I'm not spending much time in God's word. I have treasured your word in my heart. In other words, what's it mean to treasure something? What's it mean to treasure? Think about that just for a moment. If you treasure something, it's valuable to you. It's worth something. It's... It's got a value to it. And when we begin to value God and His Word more than I do those sinful habits, this will begin to prevail in our life more than the sinful habits. So thy word have I treasured in my heart so that I may not sin. Proverbs chapter 4, uh, verses 14 and 15. It says, keep off the path of the wicked. Don't proceed on the way of evil, in the way of evil ones. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass it by. What's he saying here? If you've got a struggle with alcohol, don't go by the liquor store. It's a pretty simple concept, right? If you've got a struggle with heroin, then don't go around the friends that are dealing it. You see, we can't surround ourselves with the very things that we struggle with and expect to have victory over them if they're right there near us. Because when difficult times come, and they will, the temptation will be very real and it will overcome you. 
If you struggle with pornography, I really wish I, I really, how many of you seen Fireproof? I really wanted to find one of the old computers and just beat it up just for an illustration. I really did. But we got rid of them a couple months ago. But honestly, we ought to hate it the way God hates it. And if your struggle is with pornography and the internet stuff, get rid of it. Get rid of it. You can survive without a smartphone. You can survive without a computer. People have been doing it for hundreds and thousands of years. Trust me on that one. I know it's foreign, but you can survive without it. It says, keep off the path of the wicked. Don't proceed on the way of, in the way of evil ones. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it. Pass it by. And then Romans chapter 13, verse 14. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make plans to gratify the desires of the flesh. It says, don't make plans. Why? Because sin, sin thrives in secrecy. Sometimes you get the idea that when everyone leaves and the house is empty, then I can fill in the blank. Don't make plans for it. Don't do anything that is going to bring you down and rob you of the victory of overcoming. And here's another one. 1 Corinthians 10.13 No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, He will also provide a way out so that you may be able to bear it. And can I just say this? Say yes to God and no to sin. Oftentimes a way of escape is simply saying no. No to what your flesh so strongly wants. He says there's a way to overcome temptation. Can I make this statement? Whatever temptation you succumb to is a cheap substitute for God's faithful love, mercy, and grace. Whatever temptation you succumb to is a cheap substitute for God's faithful love, mercy, and grace. Am I willing to set that aside to gratify my flesh for a moment? And it doesn't matter whether it's pornography or drugs or alcohol or whatever it may be. Think of how good God is. Think of how gracious His mercy is. Think of how plenteous His mercy has been. The very fact that He loves you. And let me just go back to this just for a moment, what I said earlier. Some of you have a past. And the past is very painful hurtful. And I don't want to minimize that. Some of you have had experiences where you've been molested as a child. Some of you have had experiences where your parents divorced at an early age and it bothered you immensely. Some of you have been in traumatic accidents. And those are things that are very real and you can't minimize. But think about how gracious God is. How wonderful He's been, even when we don't deserve it. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's loving. He loves us. What does God's Word tell us? He is a father to the fatherless. Think about that. If you don't have a physical, earthly father, you have the greatest father that one could possibly have. Our Heavenly Father. So we need to submit ourselves to God and His Word. And can I just give you a practical application of this? I think sometimes we need visible reminders of what we're going through. I tell people often who are trying to overcome addictions, visible reminders are great. One of the gentlemen that I knew that was struggling with pornography very deeply uh, lost his job over it, was caught cheating in an emotional affair on a computer, Never wore his wedding band. Oh, I hate my wedding band. It kind of gets in the way. Right. But you know what that little wedding band is every day of my life? It's a visible reminder of the one that God gave me. It's a visible reminder of the one that loves me. It's a visible reminder of the one I love. 
It's a visible reminder that there is someone else that I am responsible to and for and is responsible to me. It's a visible reminder. You don't think visible reminders are very powerful? They are. For several years, my brother went through cancer. And he had the same type of cancer that Lance Armstrong had. And my brother gave me a yellow Livestrong bracelet. Does anybody remember those? I wore it for years and years and years till one day I was taking a shower and the thing just fell off. It snapped. But for years and years, that yellow bracelet was a reminder to pray for my brother. It helped me establish a pattern of praying for my brother Craig. Just a visible reminder. This ring is a visible reminder to pray for my wife every day, to thank God for her. We need visible reminders. Number four. If you are involved in addictions of any type, you need to surrender your body back to God. Number four. Surrender your body back to God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. And then he says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good and pleasing in the perfect will of God. Is that important? Yes. Because if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're not yours. You're His. And he never asks you to die for him. He asks you to live for him. And I can't live for him and indulge my flesh at the same time. It's a choice. And furthermore, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you are bought at a price to so glorify God with your body. You're not yours. If you truly know Jesus Christ... You belong to Him. He purchased you with His blood on the cross of Calvary. So the idea that I can do whatever I want with my body, no, you can't. It's His. So well, how does that practically work? Every day it's surrendering your life and your actions and everything that would affect this body to Him. And that's easier said than done. Because every time you go by a restaurant, you want to say, man, I want to, you know, I want to dig into some of that. That's good. Whatever your addiction is, you need to surrender your body back to God. I say back to God, yes, because if you're taking it from Him, you need to give it back. Realizing that He paid a price for it. Number five. You need to make up your mind to please God. No more excuses. Make up your mind. I say, is it really that big a deal? Yeah, it is. If you're a salesman, but you're not convinced of the product's quality, until you make up your mind that that quality is better and that product is better, you're going to be a terrible salesman. If you're God's, make up your mind that you're going to please Him. Because your quality is beyond measure to Him. Romans chapter 6. Verses 12 through 16. Here's what he says, making up your mind. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. He says, therefore, don't not let sin reign in your body. Make up your mind. I'm going to live for the Lord. I want to please Him with my mind. And he says this very part, the parts of your body, your eyes, your ears, your hands, your feet, where you go, what you do, what you look at, what you listen to, what you inhale, what you eat. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. In other words, the body doesn't tell you what to do. You tell the body what to do. That's kind of backwards in our culture, isn't it? My body says I'm hungry. Well, let's go eat some more. That's what we do. 
And then he says in Psalm 101, verse 3, I will not let anything worthless guide me. Why? He says, I hate the practice of transgression or sin. It will not cling to me. He says, I will not let anything worthless guide me. Why? Because he's made up his mind. Job 31.1 He says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look at a young woman? He says, I've made a covenant. These eyes, <laughs> I'm guarding them. I'm going to protect them. I'm not going to let anything into my eye gate that is going to hinder me from living a holy life for the Lord. The bottom line is, I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes, as Job said. In Proverbs, I'm sorry, in Psalm chapter 119, verse 37, it says, Turn my eyes from looking at what is worthless. Wouldn't that be our prayer? God, turn my eyes from anything that is worthless. Don't let me see the things that would pull me in a direction that is contrary to your will. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. He says, Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Guard your heart. In the video, just for a few moments, you talked about how the lady faces rejection or feels rejection. And it's hard after finding out that your spouse is involved in pornography to trust, to be open about their feelings, to not want to just kick them. Right? It says, guard your heart. Guard it. For it is a source of life. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 says, For from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murderers, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. And that's why he says, guard your heart. Say, so, well, I'm 21, I can drink all I want. Yeah, sure you can. I'm 18, I can go to R-rated movies. Absolutely, the law says you can. Nobody's arguing that. I mean, the speed limit says it's 70 miles an hour. I can go 70 miles. The speed limit says, yeah, it's snow and rain, but yeah, go 70 if that's what, you know, floats your boat. 1 Corinthians 6.12 Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. What's he saying here? He says, I am not going to be underneath the power of anything. Say, so what's your addiction? Coffee? <laughs> Coffee's got you. It controls you. Oh, maybe, maybe your uh, drink of choice is Diet Mountain Dew. I don't know. Does it got you? Got to have that cup every morning, no matter what you do, no matter where you go. It's the first thing that I've got to have. He says, I will not be mastered by anything. Orange juice. He says, everything's permissible, but not everything's beneficial. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. In other words, there are things that you have the freedom to do but it doesn't mean that it's good for you to do it. So, number five, you need to make up your mind. If you don't make up your mind to live for the Lord, you don't make up your mind to overcome the addiction, if you don't make up your mind that you're going to please Him, you'll never have victory. You can't go into a battle half-hearted. And let me just tell you, any addiction is a battle. Ask somebody that's in the midst of one. It's a battle. It's not easy. And this is not a cure-all. These are just some simple steps that we can take to get ourselves on a path towards overcoming addiction. Let me just say this. Addiction doesn't come overnight. It's not cured overnight. It's just not. It's a day-in, day-out battle. Regardless of whatever addiction you may be facing. Sometimes it's three steps forward and two steps back. Another three steps forward and two steps back. But you don't sit there and fail. Or, or sit there where you failed. You get back up and you go again. 
And you say, God, I need your help. I can't do this, which is number six. You need to acknowledge your inability to overcome your sin on your own. Acknowledge that you cannot overcome the addiction on your own. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. As I said in the beginning, willpower will most likely fail you. How do I know this? Thousands of years of New Year's resolutions. Let's hear by show of hands, how many of you made a New Year's resolution to lose X amount of pounds and you did not carry it through? Yeah, that's what I thought. Two hands and a foot. Bottom line is, almost every one of us have made New Year's resolutions and we have failed. But we made up our mind to do it. I mean, we made up our mind that we were going to go to the gym. We were going to exercise. We were going to start eating more healthy. We were going to like put ourselves with other people that would hold us accountable. And it lasts for a little while until something comes up. Until something that distracts you gets in the way. Willpower will almost always fail you. How many people have been alcoholics and said, I'm, this is my last drink? I, I, I'm, I'm, this, I've heard it a thousand times. This is my last drink. And then uh, I've heard this one too. This is my last cigarette and I'm going to quit. And I just kind of laugh because willpower will fail you. It fails me. It fails all of us. Because none of us has extreme power. And it's not going to be found in you making up your mind. Here's the difference as a child of God. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You need the help of others to overcome addiction of any type. You do. You can't do it on your own. I've never met somebody at least in my sphere of influence and people that I've met that have had a severe addiction and just says, well, I'm done with it. I quit. And without any help, was able to overcome. We need each other's help. And I can say that there's been people in all the ministries that I've been involved with who have come to me and said, Pastor, I'm struggling with fill in the blank. And as we sit down and we submit ourselves to God... And we get in God's word, because God's word says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. I have immersed myself in God's word. And if they've been willing to do it, and say, I want to love God more than I love that sin, that they haven't gotten victory. Maybe you're one of them. But you can't do it alone. You need God's help. You need the help of other godly people in your lives to help you. But let me just review real quick. Number one. You must learn to love God more than you love that sin. And until you do that, and it's a process, and it's going to take some time. Habits didn't start overnight. They're not going to end overnight. And learning to love God and learning to put Him first is something that's going to take time if it's not your habit. Learning to pray, learning to read God's Word so that you can hide His Word in your heart that you might not sin. Learn to love God more. Number two, Admit your sin. Don't hide it. Sin thrives in secrecy. Admit it. One of the hardest things to do is when we're wrong is to admit it. I mean, is any one of us, when we're confronted with about something that we've done wrong, do want to say, yeah, I did it. (laughs) I did it. Yep, me. Woo. We, We hide those things. We want to justify, rationalize, excuse. But you have to admit it. You have to take responsibility of it. I, you have to. Number three, you need to submit yourself to God and His Word. Until you submit to God and say, God, I'm willing to follow you and obey you and do what you say is right, you won't have victory. You won't. I can tell you from years of now 20 some years in the ministry and 20 some years of dealing with people in my office. Years of people coming in saying, hey, I'm struggling, struggling with X, Y, Z. The ones who have submitted to God have had victory. 
The ones that won't, don't. It's that clear. Number four, you need to surrender your body back to God. It's His. If you truly know God, you're not your own, you're His. And so therefore, what you look at, what you listen to, what you put in, what you do to it, needs to be funneled through what would please God. Surrender your body back to Him. And then number five, make up your mind. You can't go into a battle half-hearted. you got to make up your mind. You're going to fight this. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to surrender. I'm going to fight it. My mind is made up. I'm not going to let this thing have power over me. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit have power over me. And number six, acknowledge your inability to do this on your own. You need the help of others. Most importantly, you need the help of the Holy Spirit. You need the help of God. Because you can't do it apart from Him. And there are times you need to find a brother, a sister in the church and be vulnerable. Say, be vulnerable? Yeah, be vulnerable. It's not like you're hiding it anyway. Most people already know about your addictions, whether you think they do or not. And let me just say this too on the flip side of it. Just because your addiction may not be as open as someone else's doesn't mean yours is better. Sin is sin. And if something other than the Holy Spirit is controlling you, you need to deal with it. Sometimes we have this idea that it's not that bad. It's not that bad. This is this is this is this is okay. I can deal with this. Let me just share a personal testimony. I joke about myself a lot. I struggle with my weight. You guys know that's not a secret. I'm not the athlon triathlon that uh, is, runs 26 miles. Uh, yeah, I'm not a pencil. I know me. And it seems like I can do a lot of things in extreme. Anybody like that? When you do something, you go all in. And it doesn't matter whether it's work, whether it's biking, whether it's whatever. If you're an all-in type person, you go all in. I just know me. For me, I, I, I don't dare take the first drink. I can't. I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong for you. I'm not saying it's sin for you. I'm saying for me, I know me. I know with one hot dog tastes good, three's better. Right? Some of you, you, some of you can understand that. You relate to that. And I just know me that if one beer is good, three is be better. And I don't know that I can control it. That's just me. I'm not saying it's you, but it's me. I know that I like to do things extreme. And when I hear statistics that says one in seven who takes the first drink becomes an alcoholic, I'm like, man, I hope to God I'm not the one. Because I kind of think I might be. I don't know. But I do know this. I can't have victory in any area, including what I eat, without the help of God. Now, stand up here, do I eat four steaks? No, I'd like to. I love steak. But I know it's not healthy. I know it's not good for me. Although I would love it. Don't do it. But I know that in my family, we've got a lot of largeness. You've seen my family. Now, my brother John doesn't, or Craig doesn't count because we teased him for years that he was adopted. Sorry, Craig, if you're listening. <laughs> he was the abnormal child. The other three kids, we were big. And don't, don't misunderstand. John was as big as me and bigger at one time. Just because he's a toothpick now doesn't mean he's always been. Sorry, John. I just know that if I don't watch it, I'd be 700 pounds. I have to watch it. I have to continuously say, God, help me. I have to continuously say, Lord, give me strength. That has been a hard thing in my life. I've been the biggest kid in every class I've ever been a part of from kindergarten up. I remember wrestling season. He goes, yeah, I'm wrestling 187. I remember that in, like, what, fifth grade? 
I've always been the big guy. But it's also been the very thing that I'm very conscious of. Because I don't want to stand up here and say, bless God, you need to deal with that sin. And you're looking at a guy who weighs 450 pounds. I struggle with it. I work at it. I say, God, help me. Because I still need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. I don't know what you struggle with. I don't know what your addiction is. I don't know what it is that you give into and succumb to. But no matter what it is, whatever it is that you do succumb to, whatever temptation overcomes you, it's a cheap substitute for God's faithful love, mercy, and grace. And I'm just telling you in this area of pornography, it's destroying people. Just like alcoholics are being destroyed by the alcohol. Just like addicts are being destroyed by the drugs. Is it the end of the line? No. Thank God for His grace. Thank God for His mercy. Thank God that He gives us the strength to overcome with His power. Because apart from it, you wouldn't have the victory. Thank God that He's powerful. Amen? He gives you the ability. But you can't do it alone. So this morning, I, I don't know what it is that you struggle with. I don't know whatever it is, addiction. And maybe it has nothing to do with anything I said. But you know, in your mind, in your heart, you have an addiction. And it controls you. And God's word very clearly says, 1 Corinthians, I not be under the power of anything. There should be nothing that controls you other than the Holy Spirit. And if pornography is one of them, let me just tell you, as I'm kind of focusing on that this morning, there's all kinds of ways to get help. There's all kinds of ways. If you need that help, I'll be glad to give you the resources for it. But there are web browsers that are safe. There are softwares that you, software programs that you can put on your phones, on your computers, that won't let you do searches, even if you try. And yes, if you want to do it bad enough, you'll find the ways around it. I've been told. People find the ways around. But that's where it comes back to making up your mind that you want to please God more than you want to please yourself. You, nobody can do it for you. I've known alcoholics. I've had to go to their homes at 3 in the morning and rescue their kids. If I could take it away from them, I would. But I can't. And whatever addiction you have, no one else can deal with it but you. And your dependence on the Holy Spirit. It's on you. You have to make up your mind. And I trust that you will. Let's pray.